we, uh, uh, we, we love them and we love that guy. And I hope they have, I'm for have them having four more. I really am. Amen. I know what time it is and I'll, I'll not need long if you'll go with me to Revelation chapter number 5. The whole world pauses for a few hours next week to commemorate by hook or crook Easter. And of course we know that it's that day set aside to commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love, I love not just Easter Sunday, I love the conversational buildup. I know today is Palm Sunday, and we're really not talking about that. We dwelt on it pretty heavily last year, and we will in the future. But today, I want to talk to us about purpose. Revelation chapter 5, verse number 8. The Bible said, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of of saints and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and had redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and every tongue and every people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests that we shall reign on earth and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard i saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and Ever. I want to talk to us for just a few moments about a worthy life. A worthy life. Let's ask him to help us. God, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for the people in this building today. We thank you, God, for your presence and for your word and for all that we celebrate, not just in these few days ahead, but, Lord, every day of our lives. We thank you, God, that you have been so merciful, patient, kind, and good to us. We ask today for clarity and for perspective that, God, we could allow you to do the work in us you desire that we might all of our our lives do the work that you desire from us we thank you Lord and we give you praise today in Jesus name amen 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 hallelujah amen you, you may be seated we just read from verse 8 to verse 13 and you notice that in verse 9 he said you redeemed us in verse 10, he said, you made us. Then he said, now we're going to reign with you. It began with us as a wreck. He said, and now we're redeemed, not because of what we did, but because of what he did. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. It's literally because of his blood. And now we see in verse 9 and verse 12, where they're singing this song together, worthy is the lamb now stick with me for a second titus chapter 2 verse 11 the bible said for the grace of god that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us this is what god's grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world why do we do that looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself 
for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous excited about motivated for zealous of good works I'm always sentimental when I think about investments I was uh, thinking about Hudson today and how blessed he is to as life would have it to have the mom and dad that he has and I'm thankful for my mom and dad I was not the easiest child in the world to raise and despite all of the obstacles that just parenthood and that time and place bring upon life when I was seven my mom and dad were self-employed and so they didn't have a, a, a medical insurance for the family it really wasn't available the way things were set up in that particular time and place and, and when I was seven years old I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and I know that for the rest of my childhood they were paying out of pocket I don't know how much insulin cost and, and test strips and my first blood sugar meter I think it was it was this big and doctors and this and that just aside from all the other mom and dad stuff that we always have to do and we always have to take care of and uh, and one time for a school project the question was asked what does it cost your parents to raise you and by the time we got through my medical issues I was already the most expensive kid in the class I went home and told them how lucky they were in case they didn't know and I realized pretty early on never gonna pay them back for that I knew that I wasn't because I decided at 11 that I wasn't gonna try it's never gonna pay them back for that there would probably never be a way to pay them back for that and I cracked a joke to my mom. She said, you don't have to do that. Just be worth it. And that conversation came back to me preparing for a Veterans Day service years later. We were preparing to honor our veterans, and uh, Brother Anthony Blake had challenge coins minted for everyone who was a member of our church then. That was uh, four sanctuaries ago, and it seems like yesterday to me, and uh, we really took a big part of that service to thank those men and women, and, and you could talk about, uh, I, and, and I, I don't really deserve to talk about what, what, what our military veterans have done for the country, and we could go on and on battle after battle. Over one million people have died in uniform in service to our nation and you really can't reimburse them for that what do you give a, a widowed young mother what do you give a mother what do you give a dad what do you give children who grow up without parents there's really no way to ever pay a family back but as a people as a nation hopefully we understand that one thing we can do is try to be worthy of what those individuals did we can't reimburse them but we can effort to become a people who are worthy of that and I'm convinced in my relationship with God the first thing that I concluded was that I'm an absolute wreck that he's perfect and I'm imperfect that he's high and I'm low that he is holy and there's nothing holy about me but what he does in me and what he puts there but I believe the driving force in our life as a child of God really should begin with with one simple concept he is absolutely worthy because until I see him as who he is until I understand that that, that that he's worthy and I'm not doing any of this for me I'm never gonna be perfect I'm never gonna measure up I'm not even gonna try to put that kind of pressure on myself but until my motivating factor is God is not just good he is absolutely worthy then my results are always going to be mediocre and mediocre is easy you wake up at your best all the time but the scripture tells us that he's worthy now I've watched some people now I'm not throwing rocks at anybody there are different kinds of personalities here for example some of you grew up in a church like this some of you grew up in this church and you're used to rather outgoing worship and, and I love that but it took me a minute because I didn't grow up in a church like that my first spirit filled service I walked in and they happened to be clapping. It took me a minute because we didn't clap at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Pearl, Mississippi. Like we didn't clap at all. And I looked left and I looked right. And I looked up and I couldn't figure out what we were clapping about. So I was hesitant. 
to participate. I realized 10 minutes later, these people just clap all the time. And no matter what you're doing, we're really glad that you did it or that you're doing it or that you tried to do it or that you ought to do it. I had to find my way back to the scripture when the Bible said, clap your hands all ye people and let us exalt his name together. It took me a minute because we didn't do that where I grew up. And the other thing I noticed, man, these people were two-handers. We didn't do two hands where I went to church. We didn't do one hand where I went to church. Matter of fact, if there's like a singing going on, you know, Quentin Mills is in town and Lily of the Valley stuff, you could do one hand this high. Inconspicuously. You let that get out of hand, we had bouncers. That's what they were there to do. And I understand this is biblical. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And don't even get me started on singing or shouting or dancing. You guys didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. And so when people began to preach about it, it didn't take me very long to understand. We don't clap because we like the song. And we don't clap because we like the preacher. And we don't clap because we like the singing. The Bible demanded that. But here's what we do understand. He is worthy of that. And things like like outgoing physical praise or acts of worship. We don't do that because we're feeling good. It's not because church is good. It's not because the singers are good. It's because God is good and he is worthy of that. But you hear me, we are absolutely out of line and hypocrites if we'll do it with our hands and we'll do it with our voice and then walk out of the doors of a building like this and live a slotty life unconcerned. How do you hear me? if he's worthy of your voice and he's worthy of your hands that he is worthy of your thoughts he is worthy of your commitment he's worthy of a clean mouth he's worthy of a clean heart he is worthy of our best he said because he's worthy we're supposed to try to live holy and righteously in this present world he's worthy of my expressed gratitude in the middle of a worship service. That he's worthy of my disciplines when I'm all alone and in a bad mood and nobody can see what I do or hear what I say. Did you catch that? Titus 2.14, he gave. Jesus, so no man takes my life. I have freely given it, and I have the power to take it up again. He gave. Rome did not crucify him. He gave himself for us. The Jews did not murder him. He gave himself for us. It wasn't something the high priest or Pontius Pilate did. It's something Jehovah did. He gave himself for us. And one day I'm going to stand before him, and I know know that I wasn't worthy of it and I know that I could never deserve it and I'm not conceited enough to believe that I'm any better off now than I was then it's his blood and his mercy and his kindness and his spirit but you hear me I want to live a life when I stand before him I really want to be able to say that when the switch flipped when it finally clarified I wanted to give the rest of my days to him not just to his word to him to his purpose to his spirit I want to live a life that is worthy now that don't mean what we think it means see he gave himself freely and he's not going to force you he's not going to back you in a corner and put you in a pickle where you really don't want to but now you got to no he gave and we've got a gift and that mindset that tax law loophole in the scripture Minimalist, how little can I get by with or how much do I have to do? That, that produces, that produces, a, goodness gracious, I almost said spiritual midgets, but we can't say that anymore. That changed like 18 months ago. Pentecostal pygmies, we can still pick on pygmies. People live this life. We're going to lose our YouTube channel today, people, I apologize. They live this life. Only by what they believe God, by bare minimum, makes them do. He's never going to force your heart. He's never going to force your hand. Can I help you? You don't have to do anything. 
This is all completely up to you. But if I see him as he is, something should click in my soul that makes me want to see him as worthy of my best. Perfection's not the goal. That's why I don't tolerate people who try to turn the microscope on everybody else because when they turn it on you, honey, it's off of them. And if they want to talk about what's backward in your life and what's wrong with the way you live and what's wrong with the way you worship and what's wrong with the way you pray and what's wrong with the way you function you hear me we're all here because we are imperfect and because we were wrecked in need of the grace of God we're here not to try to outdo one another we are here to pursue him not to blend into the group we are here to pursue him 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 and if you're full of his spirit it's not because anybody pestered you into it or pressured you into it but somewhere along the line you just grasped it Romans 5 tells us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us when I was at my worst he died for me and now he really is worthy of my best shot See, if we don't live with that mentality, we come to church with scoreboards. You ever gone to church? They don't play baseball. They just keep score. They don't coach you. They don't want to try to make you better. They just keep score. I mean, they're, you know, it's kind of like being a food critic. That's a job I can do. You don't have to cook. You don't have to memorize a recipe. All you got to do is eat food that the newspaper pays for and then tell them if it's good or bad. I could do that. I'm not a chef. I could be a critic. I'm not a musician. I can find C, F, and G, but I can't make them do anything that you would follow. I could be a music critic. I'm not an author. I could be a literary critic. I'm not an actor. How hard can being a cinematic critic really be? You can be an anything critic. God bless you. It's America. Be as critical as you want to be and knock yourself out. But we can't walk into the kingdom of God with a scorecard turning our eyes on other people. And whether they should or should not be, and whether they are or are not, and whether they. You want to be a miserable person, you turn into that person. And with that closely comes this other spirit. This churchy spirit, where people walk into the house of the Lord, and it's almost like they're waiting to see what God is going to do. It's like going to a Rangers game. You buy your hot dog. You find your seat. You sit down. If you sock it over the fence, I'll stand up and cheer. You strike them out, and I'll clap. You make a spectacular play, and I'll make sure you know that I appreciate it. But we don't walk into the house of the Lord to see what God's going to do today. We walk into the house of the Lord because of what he's already done. He started 2,000 years ago. And whether there's chill bumps or not, I want him to know that my heart's full of gratitude today. And whether I feel the hackles of my hair standing up or not, I'm not living for him because of how I feel. I'm living for him because of what he's already done because of who he is he gave himself and because he gave himself Titus 2 14 for us he gave himself that he might redeem us because of what he did for us now it's our turn to give and commit ourselves to him See, it's personal. It's personal. He gave himself for us. Didn't have to. Did. Could have left at any moment, and he didn't. So I was involved in this from birth because he decided that I was worth dying for. And we have got to get back to the place where we see him as being worth living for. It's terminology I don't use. You've heard me talk about it. You'll never hear me say, hey, is she in church? Hey, is he in church? Because with it comes a concept that if you're showing up enough, you got it all together. That's not how this works. 
The Bible never said if any man be in the church, he is a new creature. He said if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And so it's not about just showing up to assemble for a worship service in a building. He died for me. We've got to get back to the old way they said it. I've got to live for God. Because living for God isn't just something I do at Sunday school time on Sunday mornings. And living for God isn't just something we do when it's a Wednesday night Bible study. We live for Him in the middle of a bad marriage. We live for Him in the middle of a hard work day. We live for him in hospitals and walking through dry seasons and frustration and God forbid depression and loss. We, our life is his. He gave every last drop of his life's blood. And all I've got to do is take my worthless imperfect self and purpose, I'm not much, but I'm giving it to you. See, this has to be personal. It can't just be group think. It can't just be a group effort. And I'm not anti-group. The Bible's pro-group. I am pro-group. But the group can't fix you. And there's things the group can't help you with. This has to be personal. And if I don't have that, I fall into that spot where it takes something supernaturally manifested to move me. And you better be where God can move you in the middle of a move of the Spirit. But honey, I want to live a life where I'm easy for Him to find. He doesn't have to chase me down. I want to be in pursuit of Him. He said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Several times the New Testament tells me to knock. We don't see Him knock until revelation when he said behold I stand at the door and knock we're 66 books in I don't ever want him to have to knock on my heart's door again he was merciful enough to do that I want him to see me coming every day I want to live my life in pursuit of him not just in fickle feelings but biblical facts not just Fickle feelings, biblical facts. You ever known someone who was loved but they didn't feel loved? And they lived their life as if they weren't loved? Someone that you value but they don't feel valuable. And they live their life as if nobody values them. Someone who's important to you but they don't feel important. Therefore, they're living their life as if. They're unimportant, living their life by feelings. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a fireman. Means you're going to wake up every day at 3 a.m. and just not be able to wait to run to the firehouse and hope something. That's probably not the way it works. 3 a.m. comes to everybody. If I'm up at 3 a.m., I have indigestion or one of you are in the hospital. It is not voluntary. I just want to get that out there right now. Son got more sense than to be up at three. I'm not doing it. Here's the deal. When we live our life by how we feel, then we fall into this what we feel. You know what I found? When I'm in pursuit of Jesus, I enjoy church services more. And if my focus is off, I walk in with a layer of bubble wrap I've got to pray and crawl through before I can get to where I know I need to be. But if you're just a feeling person, instead of, boy, I haven't prayed like I should in, in two weeks and haven't cracked my Bible open in three days and my mind's been mired up in all kinds of stuff from work to politics to this or that and the other and my focus isn't here. Instead, you walk in and go, it's just not hitting me like it used to. They've changed. I don't feel what I felt three weeks ago. It's got to be this guy. It's those white shoes are so distracting <laughs> that I can't even pray. What kind of shoes you got, man? Cole Hans? Those are, yeah, 
We need to normalize. Come up here so they can see those. Now listen, I have to wear dress shoes a lot. I need this look to catch on. So if you can help, I'm, I'm down with that. How can I think about Jesus when you've got white Colhans on with a suit? How can I? I can't even listen to the sermon. I'm so busy watching her take notes. River dancing, dad, you know. Yeah. <laughs> how, can I, how, can I even, how can I even think about Jesus when, when, hey, if you ever find yourself trying to blame these people for your spiritual shortcomings, honey, you're walking a short plank into a deep ocean. Let me help you right now. We're all here because we need his grace, and you're here because you need it too. Two kinds of people in this room, sinners and sinners saved by grace. And what you need, it's not going to come from a fountain of emotion. It's going to come from a decision. He responds to us. No man can come except the Father draws him. And when he drew me, I came, and I have found how I'm a approaching him has everything to do with how he reacts to me we cannot live by our feelings we've got to live by what he said anybody besides me ever have less than stellar moments where you don't just feel Jim dandy about life I told this one one time we were uh, childless and uh, uh, we were fairly newly married. We were in our first house we owned. And uh, we found out on our first anniversary trip that we were expecting uh, Daniel. He's not here today, so I can tell you that was unplanned and quite a shock. And uh, <coughs> we, 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 big time, we bought our first dog. And I said, I never would have bought the dog if I knew we were having a baby. What are you going to do with a dog and a baby? I wish I had that problem now. But, got this German shepherd and... We get back home from our trip to the Rockies. She had never been out west. This dog was possessed of the devil. He wanted water all the time, but he turned water bowls over as soon as you put water in it. He was struggling. You give him what he needs, and he just makes a mess of it, then wonders why there's not more. I had no idea the Lord was preparing me to be a pastor, but... One day we're running late, got a client meet me at the store. I need to be there early. We owned a furniture store on two of them at that time. She's got her first new car. The dog's over there backslidden, dumping all his water out. Now I'm on my way around to refill him, and she's going to be so sweet. She said, I'm just going to drive over there and pick him up. Because after all, if you can drive on the driveway, surely you can drive in the yard. And she pulls right into this mud pit with grass on top. I heard the car coming. I turned around to say no, but it was too late. She pulled right up to me. I was, I was worried about walking in it, but she was not concerned about driving in it. And so I turned around and I said, oh, no. I said, try to back out. And she did, and just like a drill. And so I go, and I'm getting lumber. We're late. And I said, okay, when I say go, all she heard was Go. I had mud in my mouth, mud up my nose, mud in my eyes, mud in my ears, just liquid mud. It took us a minute to get out. Now I'm extremely late. And the dog's been watching the whole show, and as soon as it's over, he grabs his water bowl and shakes all the water out of it. <laughs> Standing there at that moment, I did not feel saved. I did not feel spiritually empowered. I did not feel anointed or called or chosen. I felt all kinds of ways. Let's just go with muddy and late. But I understand the scripture enough to know that if the Lord had decided to come back for me or all of us right then, everything would have been fine. Because your salvation is not so fragile as a set of car keys that you haul around and can inadvertently, accidentally leave on the counter of a coffee shop and walk out the door with. You've got to understand, this is a spiritual covenant relationship. He won't force you, he won't make you, but he wants you to, and he loves you. And that has to be a reciprocated decision. You're loved when you don't feel loved. He's with you when you don't feel like he's with you. And he's working when you can't see his hands. And you're in a 
building full of people today, some of who used to have their life wrecked by alcohol, and others were addicted to drugs, and others into vile sin we won't even discuss. And what binds us together here is we are washed and cleansed, not by our goodness, but by His grace, by what He did for us. And the excitement doesn't come from what He's doing now. It comes from who He is and what He's already done. I got to hurry. In, in chapter 5 and verse 11 of our text, he said, I heard the voice of 10,000 times 10,000 angels. And that's a Jewish euphemism. Growing up, I heard people drawing conclusions. That means there'll be 100 million of these and 100 million of those. And there may be, but it was a Jewish euphemism. Like when you say, keep, keep my pen, I've got a million of those. Doesn't mean you got a million ink pens in your desk. How big is your desk? In America, it's an expression. I've got so many of those, I don't know exactly how many there are. Keep it. It was a Jewish euphemism. What he's saying is, there were all kinds of angels. And they're singing about him. And they know nothing about being redeemed. Because they're just angels. And they know nothing about being restored. Because they're just angels. And they know nothing they know nothing about forgiveness because they're just angels. But then the Bible said we all start singing. And it's not just angels anymore. The church joins in that parade. Thou hast redeemed us. You have made us kings and priests. I don't live my life hanging my head in shame of what God brought me out of. I live it in gratitude that he brought me out of it. You don't have to live in shame about who you were or what you did. We're here full of gratitude for his grace that brought us through that. And that life we live now, let, let's stand. That life we live now is by his mercy. He's that good. He's that good. We all reach an age. Where things just change physically. But they don't have to change in our heart. They don't have to change in our mind. I was in a service in Blue Mountain, Mississippi many years ago. I was, I was 16. And that day I met old brother J.L. Pipkin. He's been in the Lord's hands many years now. God took his life and flipped it, changed it. Later called him to preach and he's built this huge church in Blue Mountain, Mississippi. It may sound like a great big town. A place. It's a huge church. And they built the Blue Mountain Children's Home. Huge orphanage. There's this old guy. He's, he's barely hanging on. He's in a wheelchair. And I heard him coming in. I don't know who Wally was, but he said, Wally, roll me to the front. He said, I'm not going to start sitting in the back now. I'm too close to getting out of here. And worship service started. And I noticed if everybody else stood up, he just threw his hands up. And there's, this, there's this powerful moment. The presence of God moving in that building and you ever seen a baby that couldn't get out of the high chair but they're just making themselves as tall as they can in it? It's that 90 year old man just trying to get a little bit taller. Tears streaming down his face. His voice trembling while he talked to the Lord. He was mesmerized and so thankful. Because that's the day I realize it doesn't ever have to wear out. And it doesn't ever have to get old. Or grow tired. What he does, he does our whole life through into eternity. It's nothing I do to pay mom and dad back for sleepless nights or money they didn't have at the moment. 
for the hoops they jumped through literally to keep me alive in those trouble years. Be a mistake to try. But I can do my best to live a life and have a relationship that brings them joy and fulfillment. I found that grandkids really help. We're even now. But you never even begin to thank the Lord for what He's brought me out of and kept me from and given me and done for me. You hear me. He died for you because to Him you're worth it. And all you got to do is live for Him because you think He's worth it. That He might redeem us Redeem means to buy back. He decided to take stripes until his organ showed because your healing's just worth that. He decided to have those thorns thrust into his skull because he just made the decision. You're worth that. Can I tell you? I don't ever want to live a life where I need somebody to provoke me to pray. I want to pray because he's worth it. I refuse to try to have church in such a way that we need somebody to browbeat us, to stand up and, and just praise him with our voice. We want to do that because he's worth it. I'm not going to follow anybody around with a Bible beating on to live right and do right. I want you to decide he's just worth that to me. He's been good to me. The book of Acts, take heed to the flock which God has made you overseer which he has purchased with his own blood. It's Gomer and Hosea all over again. God tells this young prophet to marry the town prostitute. He comes home, two kids, she's gone. Gets her back later, comes home, she's gone. Finally, she stays gone. He doesn't see her for years. Years. He gets old alone. Old. And one day he's making his way through the town. And there she is being auctioned off and slave because she couldn't pay her bills. She's not a young, beautiful woman anymore. She's neither of those things now. And walking right by, he stops. Stares. He recognizes her. He don't owe her anything, honey. It's the opposite. And he steps up. He says, what do you want for this lady? And in that time and place, lady would have been a strong word. He says, I'm going to pay what you request to redeem her. Then... He takes her by the hand and heads back home. And it was a picture to Israel about how God felt about them. And it's a picture today of how He feels. We don't spit on the people who are on the auction block right now. We were those people. And we don't look down on them or shame them. Hurt for them. Pray for them. Because he did for me what Gomer did for Hosea. He paid of himself when he owed me absolutely nothing. When everything I did was backward and everything I... How much do I owe him for that? Oh, I want to live my life saying I know I'm tired and I got 6,000 things to do but I'm making time today because you're worthy of that and I know what I'm going through and I know how I feel but there's stuff I'm staying away from because you're worthy the event. I'm not doing this because I have to. I'm doing this because you make me want to. 
I want to live a life worthy. The fact that he died for me. Can we ask him to help us right now, oh God? Right now, Jesus. Lord, all over this building. All over this building.